thank you to the Society for uh, inviting me to present the uh, 2013 uh, Dunstan Lecture. Uh, it's a real privilege, and particularly so uh, in the year that the uh, Society celebrates 50 years. Um, thank you. I first met uh, John Dunster in the early uh, 1980s. Uh, I was then working as a relatively young uh, researcher at the Medical Research Council Radiobiology uh, Unit across the road from uh, NRPB. And I met John quite a few times, but mostly at sort of uh, inter-organizational social events and uh, occasionally at, 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 at scientific seminars. Uh, I didn't know John that well. That changed in the late 1980s and then through the, uh, the sort of 90s, uh, when I became in, involved in the work of uh, ICRP and UNSCEAR, I actually got to know John very well indeed. Um, he was a great inspiration to me in many ways. Um, certainly his, his sort of consummate professionalism, coupled with the intellect he had, made him a really formidable man to deal with. Um, little got by him. Um, the respect to which he was held was enormous internationally um, and there's little doubt in my mind that in fact in terms of what I would call recognition by his peers it was certainly there but perhaps not expressed um, and I, I think Jack has done uh, the whole field of service by, by promoting this and society for taking it on as a, as a lecture. I uh, also found John with his sort of relaxed humour and, and quick wit, um, great company. Uh, I travelled with him quite a bit backwards and forwards to Unskir and attended um, uh, sort of social events with him and he really was very good company. So my, uh, my background for those that don't know me is in cell and molecular biology. Um, Although over the years and working in radiation protection work, I've, uh, I hope I've gained a, a reasonable understanding of the uh, strengths and weaknesses of epidemiological approaches, some uh, stuff on internal dosimetry, and perhaps more so on the sort of population genetics that um, uh, influence some of our judgments on, uh, on heritable risk. So the issue is really the extent to which the knowledge we can gain on the biology of the principal low-dose health effects of radiation, that is cancer and heritable disease. To what extent can that information support the epidemiology in taking us towards the central estimates of risk? I mean, you will all know that the central estimates are essentially driven by epidemiological understanding of, of health. It's a direct observation. But in many instances, knowledge of the mechanisms that underpin those health effects will help us to interpret the epidemiology better or in some cases try to plug the gaps and that's what I'm going to be trying to do today. Now sort of going back to the UNSCEAR days, in the, particularly in the early 90s, um, and I think Jack Valentin picked a couple of examples of this out during, during his talk uh, in, in, this, in, the, in the first of these lectures, that John was very keen to question the, the arguing biologists and geneticists on the sort of issues of the day. Um, to some extent, it was a rather unsatisfactory period for all concerned, because although there seemed to, progress was seeming to be made, um, there was in many instances insufficient clarity to really get that biology plugged in and the frustrations arose on how best to do that and John was one of those that really closely questioned the, the arguing biologists and geneticists on the extent to which they really could say things given the uncertainties that sort of prevailed at the time. Now, 15 years on, biomedical sciences in general have progressed enormously, and much of that is due to, if you will, increased technical abilities to be able to do things that 10 years before would appear to be completely impossible. So enormous advances, basically in, in the area of what I would call general cancer research and general research on the basis of heritable disease and indeed other diseases. So the te technology became available. Another major factor was the extent to which 
laboratories outside what you might call the sort of traditional radiobiology or radiation sciences arena began to recognize the extent to which radiation could be used as a tool for probing effects in, in, in cells and tissues. So much of the, the, the information I'll be providing today didn't come or and certainly not all of it has come from traditional radiation science research. It has come from biochemistry laboratories, genetic laboratories, people looking at DNA structure. And so that, I think, has been a, a major change in pattern um, because of this improvement in technology. So the mist has become, become to clear, that's to say that, has, has begun to clear, There's, that's not to say that there aren't uh, considerable uh, ongoing uncertainties. And what I've tried to do is to select a few areas where I think I can illustrate the sort of progress that's been made in, sup in, in supporting the epidemiology, in trying to plug some of the gaps. So, what I plan to do is to start with the cancer process in general. Just look at what, in very simple terms, look at what we now know as the sort of, some of the key principles I, uh, underpinning cancer development. I'll then go on to look at what we know from these mechanisms that, that help us to under, understand low-dose cancer risk. I'll touch on genetic predisposition to cancer, which has been a huge growth area in cancer research, again, over the last 15 or so years. I'll then go on to consider what is probably one of the more difficult areas, and I, I will take time over it, that is the risk of heritable disease after radiation, and how our views on that have changed. Uh, I'll finish off with a few comments on future studies, although I would have to say I, I would consider myself very much in the specter of, uh, of, of things uh, past rather than, uh, than anything to do with the future. But I will, I will touch on just a few ideas on where some of the growth areas might be over the few years, over the, over the next few years. And I'm certainly taking some unskier advice I had from John in the early 90s, and that is keep it simple. If you've got, if you've got some points to make, don't overburden your audience with a lot of heavy detail. And I will We'll try to avoid that. So let's start with the cancer process in general and pick out a few points. Now I think one of the, the central features of advances over the last 15 or so years has been the evidence that accumulated to support the long-standing theory of the mutational basis for cancer. Again, the technology allowing for detailed analysis of different sorts of tumours at different stages of development. And everything that has come through with regard to everything other than virally associated cancers is a, is a monoclonal characteristic indicating single cell mutational origin. And that comes from looking at different tumour samples in a different colon cancer, for example, and looking what the spectrum of mutations there are in late disease, and then tracking back, looking for which ones are most consistent when you get down to the earliest manifestations. And with very few exceptions, it's been possible to say, here we have one or perhaps two mutations which are present in all of the cells. And the overall picture is that cancer starts in what are called stem cells or, or stem-like cells, which are the primitive cells present in all tissues that are unspecialized, but which, if you like, provide the end cells for the function of that organ. So we have good evidence that single mutations in single cells can start the process. That is, albeit with an extremely low probability that that, what we would call initiated cell, will progress all the way through the multiple stages of cancer to end up with a full-blown malignancy. And again, these sequential mutations are, have a tendency to be type-specific. That is, there will be some mutations which are, which are relatively common throughout different tumor types. But looking at, for example, breast cancer versus colon cancer, you can see that there are mutations which, are, which extremely rarely occur in, in one, but very, very commonly occur in the other. So a sort of tissue-specific, gene-specific mechanism whereby 
cancers can be initiated. They will then go through, and these are uh, somewhat loose descriptions for the sake of simplicity, a promotional phase where those initiated cells start to, or that initiated cell, if we're talking about a single tumour, begins to lose some control over its proliferation. It's still not a full-blown cancer by any means. Then, through further mutations, go through a malignant conversion, and finally to the full, full progression to the sorts of tumours that um, unfortunately are, 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 are far too common in the population. Broadly speaking, you can divide the sorts of mutations into two types, although there is some overlap between them and one could argue that there are other sorts as well. Oncogene activation is where the gene is changed usually in a fairly subtle way so that the protein that that gene produces in the cell has an altered function. It has a subtle change so it interacts differently to the way in, in which it should. Okay? so-called gain-of-function mutations. And the other ones are tumor suppressor genes. Now these genes act as what are called gatekeepers to certain biochemical pathways. That is, that gene acts to keep that pathway under strict control. That pathway, for example, may act to spread signals through the cell which signal the cell to uh, divide or in some way behave in a, a, an uncontrolled fashion. So these are loss of function mutations, and the mutations that can cause these loss of functions can range, can range from small changes within the gene that stop the protein working properly, or in fact deletion of that whole gene. The whole gene is lost from the cell. So two basic types. And these, these, have, these two types of gene have these normal functions in, uh, in the cell. Um, again, two main ca uh, categories, cell development the way in which those primitive stem cells are, if you like, have a controlled way forward to, be, to dividing and, be, and, and what's called differentiating, becoming specialized cells. And the other sort, the other, the other general sort of normal function is response to DNA damage, the way in which the cell, if you like, deals with the damage that, that occur throughout its, it, 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 its time, either through exogenous agents, through chemical radicals that arise through biochemical functions within the cell, or simply through mistakes that the cell makes in replicating its DNA. DNA replication, that is the way in which DNA is, 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 is processed ready to produce two molecules from one. It's a highly controlled process, and very few errors are, errors are made, but some are made, and those need to be corrected. So you, can, you could see, for example, that in the case of, of DNA repair, if a cell loses its ability to really respond to DNA damage as part of the cancer process, then, the, the, and this, this happens, let's say, at a relatively early stage, then mutations will accumulate in that clone of cells that is coming out and it's post-initiation. And those mutations themselves can then add into the cancer process, making, increasing the probability that that altered cell, that initiated cell, will, will move through the process simply because it's generating far more mutations than is normal. So that's a bit of background on the, on the um, if you like, the, the biology of cancer. Now we'll return to some of this in some of the points I'll make. Now I, I, I can't escape from having, making, a, 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 making a brief note on the epidemiological advances. Um, that's not to say that I'm going to say very much at all about it, but it needs, things need to be placed in context, I think, in terms of some of the things I will say later on. This is just one slide that says improve resolution of radiogenic cancer types, so that is to improve understanding of dose response, age-related risks, incidence versus mortality, and a variety of other things. And clearly with regard to the data from the, uh, the A-bomb survivors, um, uh, radon-associated lung cancer, and medical exposures, we've got a lot more information than we had, let's say, back in, in 1990. And so, what we can perhaps project from that is that, certainly in case of the A-bomb data, that we've got a dose response that is strongly suggestive of low-dose linearity. That is, that they, one certainly can't exclude some sort of 
potential threshold or, or very much reduced risks at low doses, but linearity seems to be reasonably consistent. The sort of the, the simplest explanation of what we have. Radon uh, paints a similar picture. Higher risk at young ages. Now that's an interesting one in the sense that it does give a clue as to wh where radiation might be acting. For example, you could make the argument that because mutations drive cancer right the way through, that radiation could, let's say, act to uh, uh, promote or, or to sort of degenerate the mutations that, that cause malignant conversion and progression. But in that case, one would argue from a biological point of view that, that r the risk then would be of pre-existing tumours, that is those arising through other means, spontaneously or through other means, would be the main targets for radiation. That would mean that risks would tend to be higher at sort of at, 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 at older ages where those tumours arising through the, through the previous life had become established. The fact that the risks tend to be higher at young ages tend to suggest that the, that the point of action of radiation is fairly early on in the cancer process, uh, possibly actually the initiation process. So that's where we We'll, we kind of end up with the epidemiology as far as I'm concerned. I mean, there's, there's an awful lot more to say about epidemiological developments. I'm sure one of my epidemiological colleagues could easily occupy my 50 minutes with just the epidemiology. But that's just a, some framework for us to, to use to think about. Now, on the basis of what we know about the cancer process in general and the importance of if you like DNA damage and mutations driving the cancer process forward, then really the, uh, a, a major area of interest should be and has been the nature and uh, process of, and detailed process of induced damage to DNA by ionizing radiation and how that damage is recognized and dealt with. I use the pointer here now, I think. And I think it, it's arguable that this area has been the area where we've, we, we, we've learnt most in terms of our, of our now quite detailed understanding of how radiation damages DNA, how that damage is, is dealt with, and what the consequences are. And this first bullet here, critical importance of clustered and complex DNA strand breaks from single tracks has been believed for many years that radiation inducing DNA strand breaks is a key part of the, of the way in which, DNA, in which radiation uh, causes health effects. But we, what we didn't have was the, the fine detail of that. And I can illustrate that with this next overhead. And this is from uh, Hushang Nikju, who is one of, who's one of the, um, uh, the key players in this whole area. And if we go to this side and this cartoon, we can see here uh, a stylized picture of DNA double strand, the sugar phosphate backbones at the top and at the bottom, and the dashed lines representing the DNA bases. So the simplest form of damage is the single strand break. That is one, one of the strands having a sugar phosphate backbone broken there. Okay? Moving up in complexity, we could have two uh, spaced single strand breaks on the same strand. Okay? And here we'd have, we've got two spaced single strand breaks on, on one, on, on, if you like, on opposite strands, but far enough apart to not create a double strand break. And this is a, if you like, a part of the classification. So we then go to the single, the, the single double strand break, where the two breaks on the sugar, opposite sugar phosphate uh, uh, backbones are close enough to potentially disrupt the DNA helix. Bear in mind that this, this simple cartoon loses the complexity of the, of the way in which DNA is, is sort of coiled and folded. So it's at this point that we would expect to see some distortion of the DNA helix. And then we come down to complex double strand breaks. And here we have, if you like, a double strand break there with a single strand break close by. And then a double strand break, which is in fact two, du two double strand breaks, closely spaced. It's this close spacing 
but it's one of the key issues. And the general picture that arises is that for low LET radiation, for complex double strand breaks, about 20% of the breaks are of this type. For high LET, it's much higher, around 70%. Okay? Indeed, the, 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 the kind of picture that emerges is that much of the energy in low LET radiation is really of no consequence. It doesn't, and what you're getting is it's, it's just the track ends where there's enough energy being put into a, a, a DNA a double strand volume to create the, this sort of complex damage. It's also uh, informative to look at the LET relationship here. And if you look at the, consider this to be a sort of a, an RBE, uh, some uh, arbitrary scale here, and you can see the various. Uh, types of, of double strand damage, complex, the, the highly complex damage by itself, s simple double strand breaks, and the, 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 the sorry, the, it's, it's basically that one, that one, and those two combined. And the more complex double strand breaks have the, um, the, the, the most, um, how can I put it, strongest RBLET dependence. And that, I think, is something that certainly led many of us to feel that this, these were the ones that really mattered. I mean, you don't have to be a hotshot molecular biologist to go down this sequence here and say, that's going to be easy to repair, that's not going to be too tough, neither's that, neither's that. And it's when you get down here that the trouble begins. But that's where the, 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 the DNA helix is going to be really badly distorted. And it's not going to be easy to put that back the way it was. And that's indeed what was then found when these, the repair processes that, that act on this kind of damage were, uh, were really dissected. So there's a process which is called non-homologous enjoining. And basically, what the cell does is, is to throw its hands in the air and say, I can't do very much with this. I'm just going to patch it up, and which is what happens. It's a process that is prone to error. Very many of these breaks, probably the majority of them from co of these complex breaks, aren't put together, put back together the way they're in they were intended to be. So there you have mutations, depending upon where that damage is, that... Um, that is going to have a potential effect on the cell. And this is a, this sort of complex damage in the way in which it's repaired is a, is a, is kind of not quite unique to DNA, but very unusual in other, in, a, in other circumstances. That is, there are very few exogenous agents that will produce this complex double strand break picture. So that again is, is something to bear in mind. The process is also non-inducible. That is, that the proteins, all of which have been, the genes have all been cloned and the proteins analyzed, it's, it's known in some detail. Uh, and this whole process of non-homologous enjoining is present in the cell at a fairly constant level. It's not induced if you give chronic exposures or it's chronic damage, it doesn't, it, the, the activity to produce those proteins doesn't change. So it's, there is a, and again, that's something that is uh, important in the sense of what you might call adaptation, or potential adaptation. And again, the prediction from these sorts of uh, repair uh, pictures is that the repair errors will tend to be fairly gross. Either there will be large losses of DNA, or the DNA will be rearranged in a, in a, in a fairly um, gross manner. And that's indeed what we see when uh, cellular systems are used to analyze the mutations induced by ionizing radiation. They are large deletions and rearrangements. So the key message here, because bear in mind that the, what you saw of the complex double strand break picture, which comes from Monte, a combination of Monte Carlo track simulations backed up by experiments, is that single ionizing tracks can induce characteristic DNA mutations. So we're not talking about, in, in the main, about you know, two tracks interacting. We're talking about single tracks, the lowest dose possible. So low dose linearity for the DNA damage component of tumor risk would be expected from this. Okay, and again, with really an awful lot of information in this area.
So the mi missing part of the picture might then be, we've got, we've got predictions, if you like, that radiation acts to initiate tumorigenesis. We've got evidence from the DNA damage response uh, process that the mutations, which would con consider as potential initiating events, are large deletions. So the missing part of the picture would be, can we find evidence of specific DNA gene deletions associated with radiation-induced cancer? And that has been really tough. Um, the, the, if you like, the, the logic might be, well, you, 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 you find tumors, human tumors, from epidemiological studies, and using the power of the molecular biology, you know, analyze those, looking for characteristic mutations. That has not been very successful. And the reason it's not been successful is fairly straightforward. That is uh, attri attributability of a given tumor to radiation. Is that it's actually pretty tough to be able to get hold of, even if you can get hold of the tumor material, to have a, a, a enough of them with a high level of, of attributability to make the, the exercise, in my view, worthwhile. That's not to say it's, it, it has been attempted and it's not been terribly successful. Some A bomb tumors have been analyzed in that way, uh, radon associated lung cancer um, and uh, thyroid cancer um, following the, uh, the Chernobyl accident where attributability is probably as good as it's going to get. The problem has been the extent to which uh, there are appropriate controls. You have a mix of problems uh, which persuaded um, many laboratories, including my own at the time, to start to see whether the question could be answered using animal models. Again, coupling it with the, um, uh, with the improved technology that's available for, um, uh, from the uh, cancer research um, laboratories. Here's an example of, this has been done for I think now three tumor types. This is for radiation associated specific losses in intestinal tumors in mice. It's been done for mouse leukemia and some mouse um, uh, basal cell carcinomas. And if you like, the technical advance has been to be able to take material from, well, first of all, first of all, to, it's, been, it's possible with animal studies to actually design your experiment through, through uh, mouse breeding and sometimes through mouse genetic manipulation to have a model where attributability is, is not a big issue. That is, you can get plenty of tumors with a high probability that they're radiation induced. You've got plenty of tumors, you can do large numbers. And in, in which case, the question we're asking is the spectrum of mutations that we see in the radiation uh, associated tumors different from those arising spontaneously. So plenty of controls. So what we, the technical advances are twofold. One is the ability to section through tissue with potentially very early tumors in, distinguish them, distinguish them by staining, and for that staining process and the preparation process to allow for high quality DNA extraction. Second then, micromanipulation, the ability to, to get at sections like this, and this is a, uh, an, an early tumor arising in, from the, the base of the crypt in a mouse intestine, to be able to scrape out a very small amount of material, amplify the DNA from it, that is used by a chemical means to make more DNA from what is a very small sample, and then from the advances in mouse genetics to analyze whole chromosomes using markers that are spread down the chromosome. And again, part of the breeding process of the mice to get to this point is that you, you need to be able to distinguish one chromosome, in this case chromosome 18, there are two copies in every cell, as there are for most chromosomes, the autosomes, to distinguish the two, the, the two chromosomes. So this is material scraped from there, amplified, and then analyzed for the presence or absence of markers. And what you see here is one consistent area of loss around here, around 10 centimorgans, and again a consistent area of loss around about 30 centimorgans. The maps tell us what genes might be in there. You can and now, and even more so than when it was done, this was done probably 10 years ago, um, 
analyze even down to just a few cells that you could that are considered to be just aberrant crypts. And in this case, you, you don't see that loss there, but that loss continues. So in this case, and in these other examples that I mentioned of other mouse models, that it's been possible, and that, again, which is reasonably consistent, that we have radiation-associated losses in, in particular areas. This is, in fact, losing a gene called APC, which is the same gene that drives uh, human colon cancer. Um, so, if you like, not without some uncertainty, but at least a, the beginnings of a picture of consistency right the way through from initial, the types of initial damage that radiation causes through to potential initiating events in, uh, in, um, in, in cancers. So the key message here is, well actually there are one other thing, animal models were also used to test the, uh, the proposition that radiation could act at, diff you know, at, at other points in the, in the, in the cancer process. Um, and it, in this case you have studies where animals were treated with chemical carcinogens and then subsequently after some time with radiation to see whether radiation accelerated the development or increased the numbers of, um, of cancers and it was found that as far as um, if you like l late, later process action that radiation was very weak so again it tends to push us down towards the early stages of cancer development where radiation is acting So let's look at some broad conclusions from that. Yeah, this one we've really pretty much covered. We've got associations through here, DNA damage repair, gene loss, tumour initiation, which again would be consistent with low-dose linearity for risk modelling. This is, if you like, a, the biologist's interpretation of this. Is if low-dose radiation is acting to increase a natural pool of initiated cells, because at any one time there are going to be initiated cells in, in tissues which are arising spontaneously or through other means, radiation, if it's acting early, is adding to those. So on the assumption where the evidence points that that is indeed the case, then Basically, we're increasing the pool, and that pool, radiation-induced spontaneously or arising through other means, are going to be subject to the same modifying factors. And that, from a biological point of view, is what one would kind of use to support the fact that it's, it's, it's a, a, multi, multipli a multiplicative models of risk may be more appropriate in terms of epidemiological modelling. There are some provisors there which we may wish to discuss at a later point in the day, but that certainly would be my view. Uh, DNA damage repair studies, I think they can contribute to the understanding of dose and dose rate effects, that is the the DDREF factor, the reduction factor that um, uh, we need to develop in radiological protection to, to, to make the shift from uh, data at, 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 at um, acute doses down to those uh, from protracted radiation. And if we've got a, repair, a, a key repair process that is um, essentially error prone and non-inducible, then we really wouldn't expect very high values for DDREF. And I, I mean, I'm going back now to the 80s when there was discussion of, of uh, DDREF of, you know, 10 perhaps. Um, that has, I think, faded away and that would be consistent with what we now know of the repair process. And as I mentioned earlier, the RB-LET relationships that we're, we can see in terms of those complex double-strand breaks, as that's where much of this starts, would um, helps us, I think, to, to or would support some of the evidence we have, uh, let's say from animal studies, uh, whole animal studies, on uh, radiation weighting factors for, uh, for different energies. Now I'm going to say a few words on the on an associated area of development, which is genetic susceptibility to cancer. And one can look at this in, in a number of different ways. But certainly for me, the key question isn't, oh, is it going to be possible to analyze a whole you know, raft of people by genetic means and give some prediction as to the extent to which they are going to be more or less susceptible to radiation-induced cancer. And I know 
that kind of stuff does get discussed. To me, that's a kind of that, that's some way down the line, if ever possible. The bigger question for me has always been the extent to which are we looking at a situation where we are basing our risk estimates on whole populations and variability within the population may be such that it provides what I would call an unacceptable distortion of that population risk. I mean, for me, again, an unacceptable distor distortion would be perhaps 80% of the risk in 20% of the population. I mean, you could, one could arrive at one's own decision on that, but I think that would be a real problem in radiological protection because we would be uh, underprotecting a good number of people and potentially, if, 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 if you wanted to take that view, overprotecting some others. But overall, the problem would be we have a distortion here that we need to understand. So what have we learned? And again, this has been a huge growth area, as I mentioned, in, in cancer research in general. We have some limited evidence for elevated risk in some medically exposed patients with rare cancer-prone genetic conditions. Now, these are the ones that are very strongly expressing. They have a, they have a germline mutation, and that, will, that take, go, feeds forward to 100% in most cases risk of a particular cancer type. I mean, examples are a retinoblastoma, which uh, uh, in terms of spontaneous risk gives, gives eye tumours in children and bone cancers also uh, 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 as life progresses. Um, a disease called uh, basal cell nevus sy uh, syndrome which gives basal cell skin uh, tumours and a brain tumour called med medulloblastoma and a condition called Lee-Fraumeni syndrome which uh, gives a range of different tumour types uh, throughout life. Uh, so we have some evidence, uh, it's, epidemiologically, that they are at increased risk of radiation-induced tumours, but actually quantifying that is very difficult, it has proved very difficult. Um, on the other hand, because of technical advances, it's been possible to create mouse models of many of these genetic conditions that we that, albeit rare in the population, and that has that backs up the idea that they are also at increased risk of uh, of radiation-induced cancer. And then we have a a different problem, which is that, and that is a, a lot of evidence growing recently through what are called genetic association studies. That is, if you've got a familial cancer, you can track that back through the family members, even into the uh, past generation, and see a, a really consistent pattern of cancer. On the other hand, you get situations where, yes, you can see that there is perhaps an overall risk of cancer, but it's not that prominent within a, within a pedigree. Um, and you get situations where you just get odd cases within families that raise questions. And what that has, if you like, produced through modern genetic association studies, looking at large numbers of people to see whether they've got variant genes in certain parts of their, uh, of their genome. And these are genes of what are called low penetrance. They're not highly expressing, often subtle changes in, in proteins that really add together. That is, it's not, one gene's not going to do it, but four or five of these could tip the balance. And equally strong gene-gene environmental uh, uh, interactions. And that's been a growing area in, in cancer research. And one would ask the question, well, if that's the case for spontaneously arising tumours, could that be a source of distortion? Um, I'm not aware, although that could be changing, of the extent to which that is possible, if you like, linked to epidemiological studies. I know there's been a lot of discussion on doing this, and things have improved literally within the last couple of years because of the, what's called, third generation sequencing. Whereas in the past, you wouldn't, get, you wouldn't take it on simply because of the workload. Now DNA sequencing um, is a lot quicker and cheaper. So it's certainly re reaching a point where that, that could be taken on in, um, uh, in radiation studies. But what has been possible is, again, going back to, to mice and rats and asking the question there. And that has been successful in, in pointing up the fact that there are um, major interactions between 
uh, variant genes, looking at, if you like, crossing different mouse strains and looking for changes, mapping those changes, and seeing the extent to which they are having effects. Um, so there we have a proof of principle, uh, but quite a lot of uncertainty. So the key messages there are that the strongly expressing genetic disorders are basically too rare in the, in the population to impact on population-based risks. I mean, we're talking about fractions of 1% of the population with, these, with these, these strongly expressing genes. We've got possible distortions through combinations of these more common variant uh, genes, but I'll give you a personal opinion here. I think the way things are looking at the moment the numbers of these genes that are coming out through association studies in humans and through the mouse studies that have been done is that we're actually talking about a large number of genes, of variant genes. Now, the more there are, the less likely I think there is that there are going to be major distortions. But you can't exclude it, um, and I won't go into detail on that, but I think that is something that, that remains an outstanding issue. I'm now going to switch to heritable effects, and some of this is a little difficult, and I'll, I'll take it as slowly as I can, um, and I'll just give you some background first on the, where we were, let's say, back in the early 1990s. Okay. Big problem, we've got no positive epidemiology uh, on the... Uh, possible genetic effects in the offspring of irradiated parents. That is obviously the difference between cancer and heritable effects is in cancer the effect is in those that are irradiated and for heritable disease it's in their offspring and then the progeny thereafter. So we've only got an upper limit set by what we, we have been unable to see. On the other hand, experimental studies are strongly positive. I mean, the, the, the most informative studies are those that have been done on, on mice. And what was the, the route that was taken uh, quite reasonably is that we've got mouse mutagenesis studies um, underpinning quantitative estimates of what's called the doubling dose for genetic humans. Now, the doubling dose is the dose of radiation that will create as many mutations in a generation as those arising spontaneously, doubling, okay? It's, a, a, it's essentially a relative risk measure, and it applies to, if you like, a protracted irradiation during that generation. So that's the, that's the doubling dose. The other problem that we had, or one of the other problems we had, was great uncertainty how to deal with common multifactorial diseases that require these gene environmental interactions. Now for the, the simple um, uh, genetic effects, I call them simple, these were the single gene effects, something like uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, lesh disease, these, you, get, you have the gene, you have the disease. Um, and understanding what sort of mutations create that has been a major growth area. When we come down to these so-called multifactorial diseases, we talk about heart disease, a variety of neurological disorders, diabetes, um, a range of rather uncertain uh, abnormalities present at birth. Um, not, not single gene effects, much more complex. Uh, and another area of, of uncertainty was the, what's called the equilibrium calculation. I mean, it's important for obvious reasons when one is dealing with, with genetic effects that go through populations over time and through generations, that you look to see how that, uh, with protracted radiation in each generation, how that might build in the population. So this equilibrium calculation, basically what it does, it says, right, here we have a, a, a baseline, which is the mutations in, which are arising spontaneously or through other means in the germline. You're adding in, in each generation, a new batch of, uh, of radiation-associated mutations. And so that equilibrium, okay, that's present without the radiation, will increase Will, will climb upwards and it'll only tail over when the, an equilibrium point is, is reached, whereas the, when the induction of those mutations by radiation is balanced 
by the loss of such mutations through selection. That is, mutations usually provide some degree of what's called fit reproductive fitness problems. And so, basically, it will rise up like that and then reach a new equilibrium. And that's the way, and quite rightly, the genetic risks are expressed. When that calculation was done uh, in the past, we, we were talking you know, literally thousands of years for that equilibrium to be reached. And that was rather unsatisfactory situation. We don't normally think about risks projecting them so far, but you can understand why, for, in genetic, for genetic reasons, one would wish to do that. Overall estimates of risk most uncertain, and a key assumption in the use of the doubling dose and the equilibrium calculation was that radiation-induced and spontaneous mutations were of the same types. And one of the big advances was well, that that's not the case. And this again fits into the earlier part of the DNA damage and repair uh, picture that I painted earlier on, is that radiation is good at producing large DNA losses and re rearrangements. Very weak at producing subtle DNA changes. And so these mutations differ, induced mutations differ from spontaneous mutations and certainly result in less fit offs offspring. So what, what was basically what the mouse data were telling us were that, were that a large number of the mutations weren't surviving through embryogenesis. There would be a developmental failure fairly early on because of large losses of DNA. Spontaneous mutations, many of them much more subtle and would survive through that developmental process. So, uh, and much of this work was led by uh, Sanka, some of you will know, and, and colleagues working with, initially with ICRP and then through with BS7 and UNSCIA. Um, and the doubling dose was now, the calculation of the doubling dose was completely revised and, and included a correction for reduced recovery of, in, of, of radiation induced mutations in live births. And equally importantly, the poor reproductive fitness means that the radiation associated mutations are not surviving in the population. The population dynamics are different, so the mutations are not surviving, and by uh, computation, it was uh, a different scenarios were computer simulated and two generations say 50 years which again I think from a, a projection point of view is, is it, I, I certainly feel somewhat more comfortable with um, was the one that was chosen by ICRP and indeed by BS7 uh, in their calculations. The final one was multifactorial disease which had been previously treated in a given the lack of understanding in a, a very a, 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 a rather conservative way. Um, I mean, I think it made up about a third of the heritable risk, even though we didn't un actually understand much about the genetics of these diseases. Um, that again was, was looked at by computation and shown to be much less than previously judged. I mean, the two, the two main biological drivers are the frequency of the uh, gene variation in the population that can affect these disorders and if you're only then adding a small number of fresh ones through radiation is not going to make that much difference and also the fact that many of these mutations that arise spontaneously which drive these multifactorial diseases again are rather subtle changes in genes and proteins. The fact that radiation is, is, is deleting great chunks of DNA in fact re, re, tends to reduce the genetic risks. The risks were revised and this directly led ICRP in publication 103 to reduce the tissue weighting for the gonads from 0.2 to 0.08, which is the biggest single change, I think, in the, in, the, in the sort of foundation to the risk estimates. And I think it's really the best example of the extent to which fundamental knowledge can change the way in which we, uh, we look at risk issues. So I'm just going to finish up with a few thoughts on areas where we probably need more information. Um, that's not to say the areas I'm leaving out don't need any, but these were, I mean, I could, uh, I believe anybody in my position could put up a huge wish, wish list here, and I would certainly wish, I wish to avoid that. 
There's a new ICRP report in late gestation, I think is the best way to describe it, um, on stem cell responses and tumorigenesis. I mentioned early on that the, the, the evidence points towards stem cells as the main targets. A lot of the information that I've been talking about with regard to basic mechanisms wasn't done in stem cells uh, for technical reasons. Now, stem cell biology is, allows for a lot more makes available these cells for much more detailed studies and that's certainly kicking off. There are also some ideas about how stem cells are organized, new ideas organized in tissues. Um, some debate in fact about stem cell niches and other ways in which they, 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 they organize themselves in tissues. So I can see that, that I hope that report stimulates um, more activity in that area. I've mentioned already common genetic factors and tumor risk are still an outstanding issue as to whether there might be some distortion. And then non-mutational epigenetic effects. Um, you'll be aware of debates that have um, taken place on things like induced genomic instability and bystander effects, the extent to which these might be influencing our, um, our view of, of health effects from radiation. Um, unfortunately, they've both those things have been around a long time, unless something has happened very recently, I've not seen a really clear picture of, or as clear a picture of where that might fit in as compared to the much more substantial, if you like, uh, direct DNA damage and repair um, pathway links that uh, we've already discussed. That said, within, over the last two or three years, um, again through technology, the, um, the ability to really, de really closely analyze uh, epigenetic effects in cancer and indeed inheritable effects in, in, in humans through, for example, uh, twin pair studies, has highlighted the importance of what I would call secondary changes to DNA, particularly methylation of DNA. So DNA is organized into chromosomes. Part of that organization and the way in which DNA activity is mobilized is due to changes in secondary structure. Methylation, the way the DNA is, is coiled, the way it interacts with proteins. And I think that's coming through much more strongly and I would hope that that would perhaps provide a more clear focus for the, the sort of epigenetic investigations on radiation effects than we've perhaps seen in the past. It's not to completely put aside uh, inst induced genomic instability and bystander effects, uh, but rather just get a better context for epigenetic effects in general. I'm just over my time, so I will thank you for your attention and uh, talk to you later when we have a panel discussion. Thank you very much.